So we make this effort to come toward Krishna. Krishna responds, Oh, uh, now I'm going to give you this buddhi yoga. You'll find out uh, throughout the Bhagavad Gita one term uh, for Krishna consciousness or devotional service is buddhi yoga. This word B U D D H I, same as wise, the wise, or, they are, or the, even the Buddha, buddhi. Uh, but the, the, uh, and, and Prabhupada mentions in the second chapter uh, that Krishna has used this term already, buddhi yoga, uh, and now he's saying it explain it. Explain it. Uh, the word buddhi usually is translated as intelligence, but it's also uh, an element in our subtle body. There's the mind, which we've already mentioned, manas, uh, uh, the three uh, subtle elements, manas, mind, above that buddhi, and above that ahankara. Uh, these are three uh, uh, layers of the subtle self. Yeah. And so this buddhi is intelligence and the intelligence is what directs our attention it's not enough that you see things but there's a question of what you notice or what you don't notice what you recognize what you don't recognize you can see something and not know it I could be in Washington DC and somebody would say, oh, look, as you look, there was the President of the United States. He walked right in front of me, but I didn't recognize him. And that, so the phenomena of recognition, of being able to see something and recognize what it is. So this buddhi yoga, which directs our attention and governs recognition, this buddhi yoga is how the super-soul in our heart directs us. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, to those who want to know me, I give them the intelligence by which they can come to me. If they want to forget me, I also give them the intelligence to forget me. He says, I'm situated in everyone's heart and from me comes remembrance, knowledge and forgetfulness. So if you, the people who can't see God anywhere, who's convinced there is no God, who have some bright arguments that there is no God, Krishna gives them those arguments. That's the buddhi. But if we want to remember Krishna, then Krishna gives us remembrance. So this is buddhi yoga. So, and then yoga just means to connect. So it's how that is used to connect us with Krishna, and therefore Prabhupada calls it real intelligence. And Prabhupada says, buddhi yoga is the process by which one gets out of the entanglement of this material world. The ultimate goal of progress is Krishna. Uh, so this is, this is uh, Buddha Yoga is, is described here. And then Prabhupada mentions a person can have a bona fide spiritual master, may belong to a spiritual organization, but still may not be bright enough to make much progress. Very sincere, but maybe not too smart. What happens? Krishna gives him instructions. He gives him guidance from within. You, it's a very common experience that, that when we are in, very inquisitive to our spiritual advancement, we will discover, pick up a Bhagavad Gita, open it up, and here's the verse, that, the, or the words that just you need to hear, that tells you what you should know. This will happen quite often. Or you'll meet somebody who will say what you want to do. Or you even hear somebody in the next room say something but that. Krishna controls this. He, he shows us the way to go. So I give them the understanding by which they can come to me. 
And when that, that kind of thing starts to happen, a devotee becomes filled with gratitude for Krishna. You can now see that I'm, I'm not by myself. <clears throat> that when I wanted to come to Krishna, he made all arrangements. He sends his devotees so we can associate with them. <coughs> he gives us, anyway, makes all provisions. Um, even, even my, by the way, let me I'll tell you a little personal story, just, just to verify this. Before I had ever met any Krishna devotees, at least knowing it, so I was in religious studies. This, uh, uh, they had just started in America this, this academic study of religion, an uh, idea that we had stolen really from the Germans, Religionswissenschaft, you know, that you're going to study religion not from a, a uh, uh, confessional point of view, not as a priest or a minister, but just religions as a human activity. And then, then you could. So I wanted to look at all religions. I had studied philosophy as an undergraduate and been not satisfied with that. So let me study religions. And all the philosophers I knew in the philosophy department hated religion, and I started to think that maybe there's something to it. Anyway, I was curious. So there was this new thing, this department of religion studies. So I was. Uh, so I had taken you know, three different uh, Hinduism courses and read the Bhagavad Gita in three different translations. And I was really fascinated with the Bhagavad Gita. But it was very hard. So anyway, I had this class. We are again reading a new translation. And, and I have to say that all the teachers of Hinduism <laughs> were all adherents to the impersonalist school. They thought this was standard Hinduism, was what we call Mayavada. Uh, and that Krishna is also Maya. In fact, they were Indians. They were Bengalis for that matter. And they're all brainwashed by the Ramakrishna mission version of Hinduism, if you're familiar with that. Anyway, so they pre all presented a certain point of view. Uh, so but I was reading this new translation of the Bhagavad Gita that just came out. And, and I, I thought, well, this time I read it, that actually what the Bhagavad Gita is teaching is surrender to Krishna. I couldn't believe it. I read again, and I think that's what it's teaching. I thought it was my original discovery. Because all the professors, nobody was saying that, you know. So I had a paper due on the ethics of the Bhagavad Gita. And I wrote what the teacher wanted us to say you know, about the ethics of the Bhagavad Gita. And then the last page I talked about how the Bhagavad Gita is actually teaching surrender to Krishna. And the teacher gave me a B instead of an A because I said that. <laughs> it wasn't something that the professor had been teaching. But anyway... So when I thought the Bhagavad Gita was saying surrender to Krishna, I thought, you know, if the Bhagavad Gita is saying that, that's what I should do. And I was sitting at, 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 at our dining room table, and I had the Bhagavad Gita in front of me, and I went like this. I closed my eyes. I said, surrender, surrender, surrender. I looked, nothing happened. <laughs> but within a month, I'm walking across campus, and I hear this ching, 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 and the first time I see Hare Krishna devotees chanting on, on, on our campus. They had come down from New York to start, a, to start a temple in Philadelphia, and they were were chanting Hare Krishna. And I didn't quite, you know, put them together with this Bhagavad Gita, but there they were. And I went up to one of them. I was interested because, uh, you know, when I was a child in our church, we would collect money to send missionaries to India. So, but I thought, wow, look, the missionaries are coming this way. That's a big change. 
I thought that must be it, so let me check it out. So I went and talked to a devotee and got, got a piece of literature. And then a friend I knew from college called me up. He said, hey man, there's this far out love feast. You got to come, you know, you, you've been to the temple and, and here I am. So, but I, you know, it started with this surrender. And looking, well, Krishna's in the heart, you're, you know, you're, you're asking, you know, you'll come. I mean, that's just my example. There are many stories like that. <coughs> when, you, when you really want Krishna, he responds. And so he says he's looking for us. So these people, he's now he's talking about his advanced devotees. To those who are constantly devoted to serving me with love, I give the understanding by which they can come to me. And then he says, Tesham eva nukam partam maham agyana jam tamaha for them, he says, Anukampa Artam, for the purpose of showing them mercy. Prabhupada translates it to show them special mercy. These people. Krishna says, uh, uh, Aham Agyana Jam Tamaha Nashayami Jnana Dipena. He says, I, and he says, Atma Bhavasto, who am situated in their hearts, destroy. Uh, this, this word is Nashayami. I destroy the, the darkness, Tamaha, Agyana Jam, born of ignorance. Situated in their hearts, I destroy the darkness born of ignorance. Jnana di pena basvatata, basvataha, by uh, the uh, lamp, the bright glowing lamp of knowledge. So the darkness is in our heart. Krishna is sitting in the heart. He destroys it for us with the lamp of knowledge, jnana di pena. The darkness is born of agyana, ignorance, so it's destroyed by the lamp of knowledge, jnana dipa. Uh, that's, that's what he says he does. So uh, this is how we come to Krishna. The, the, what, it's not just we may hear it from the Bhagavad Gita or from a teacher, but it's also there in our hearts. Uh, and Krishna himself is participating in, in our deliverance from the darkness of ignorance. Why does he do this? Because he wants us back. If you read about Krishna, you know that he's in the spiritual world and he's surrounded by perfect devotees who love him in different ways. He's surrounded by Radharani and the uh, and the gopis, he has Balaram, he has all the Calvary boys, all these perfect devotees. We're missing from those groups. Why are we missing? Because we decided, well, I want my own God project. That's what we're in the world, competing to become the supreme, right? That's what we do in this world, try to be better than somebody else. If we try to buy this product or that product so we'll become better than the other person and make more money so we'll become better to have a certain car so we'll become better to be smarter than other people. Everybody has their little God project going on. But they all end in the grave, you know. One heap of dust is not much better than another heap of dust. All the corpses are equal. Uh, but that's what happens in the world. We've got our little project going on. Because we, you know, we didn't want to be the servant of Krishna. Now's our chance to rectify that mistake. And Krishna's making it very easy for us to come back to him. And so here he speaks, uh, by the way, this is very elementary Sanskrit in the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, if you take a university Sanskrit course, you can pretty much read the Bhagavad Gita at the end of a year. It's in the Mahabharata. It's very, very simple Sanskrit. You go from this to Srimad Bhagavatam, you're in a whole other world. So Krishna has explained this very, very simply. 
the most profound truths in the most difficult Sanskrit literature, like the Upanishads, he, uh, the Vedanta Sutra, he's made very clear uh, and, 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 and very, very simple. Uh, so, and offering this, this mercy to Arjuna, who is a, no, he's a warrior, he's, he's very smart, but basically he's not even a, a brahmana. He, he's a soldier, uh, a prince. Uh, Arjuna's response, oh, by, by the way, earlier in, in, in this, uh, uh, in, in this uh, dialogue, uh, 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 Arjuna uh, has told Krishna, you know, I'm confused. They, they were like friends, but now he says, I'm confused. What is my duty? Uh, now he, then he says, you know, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. Uh, everything it looks like in this battle, everything I do, whatever I do, it's going to be wrong, and there won't be a good end. What should I do? And he says, Sisha Teham, I am your student. I am your pupil. Uh, Shadima, please instruct me. Pam uh, Prapanam, I am surrendered to you. So he, now the relationship is from that point on. Uh, Krishna is the teacher, Arjuna is the student. Krishna is the guru, Arjuna is, is the disciple. Uh, and, and so here's these four essential instructions and then uh, Arjuna says his response in, in text uh, 12 and 13 um, he says to Krishna param brahma param dhamma pavitram paramam bhavam you are the param brahman you are the supreme brahman uh, he is acknowledging Krishna's position. You are the supreme Brahman. Uh, uh, you, the ultimate abode, the purest, the absolute truth. You are the eternal, transcendental, original person, the unborn, the greatest. These are the words that he's uh, using here. Purusham, uh, Shasvatam, Divyam, Adi Deva, the first of the Devas, the supreme. Uh, uh, God, who's unborn and, uh, and the greatest. And then he says in the second of the verse, uh, you, you have declared this to me, but it's not just you. And then he lists all the sages, all the, all the rishis, the devarshis, Narada, Asita, Devalo, Vyas, all these have also said the same thing about you, and now you're saying it to me also. So here, uh, Arjuna, is, in case you think he might be just uh, sentimental or off his rocker, uh, he's, he's recognizing actually this has already been said, and now you've said it to me here, but said it in a very brilliant way. I mean, just to put all that in four verses is very, very, and simple Sanskrit, very, very good. So that, that, that's why these, these four verses are called the four essential verses of the Bhagavad Gita. And I suggest, would you have a time, time to look at these uh, uh, again and read Prabhupada's purport uh, in full. This again, this is the, 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 the tenth chapter, uh, verses 8, 9, 10, and 11. And then there's Arjuna's response. You can all uh, please take some time and go over them again. And so now I'll stop and, and see if we have any, uh, anybody with questions or comments or doubts, fears, whatever. And Prabhupada said silence means agreement. <laughs> no, it's perfectly it's perfectly fine that you, know, you don't accept everything flat out. Yes. Uh, in the first part, you said about 
the sukshma sharira and sthula sharira and uh -huh. mind and paramatma. Yeah. No, no, not th different things. Yeah, sh the, yeah, mind is the shukshma sharira. Part the shukshma sharira has three parts, manas, buddhi, ahankara. Yeah. And then there's the paramatma. Yeah. Atma, paramatma, yeah. And when the uh, mind and paramatma leaves the sthula sharira, there what? The sthula sharira, it leaves the sthula sharira, and mm -hmm. when they enter yeah. into the another one. And you say that the mind is going along with the Paramatma. Mm -hmm. So to go to the moksha, you need to get freed of mind as well. You need to have only Paramatma along with you. So how to get freed out of that? Or how to get uh, come out of the... Uh, there's a statement, that? yeah. So what, he, if, if, what he's saying is, uh, how do you become free from the subtle body? Uh, because it go, when you transmigrate, you take it with you. Uh, and uh, liberation is really liberation from the subtle body. Uh, the subtle body is made of material desires. And when they're gone, uh, uh, there's a statement uh, that... Uh, um, I can find out where it is exactly in the Bhagavatam, that devotional service dissolves the subtle body of the living entity. That's what it does. That sub because that subtle body is the place where all our karma is. Uh, good karma means you take birth again to enjoy some good fortune, you know, you're born handsome, smart, rich, or whatever, you know. That's good, good karma. But then the good karma runs out. You know, all of a sudden, it's just gone, finished. The good karma only lasts a certain time. Uh, and then if we do have done sinful things, or, you know, then bad karma comes. That also runs out. You can even go up to uh, the, the Svarga, the, the, the material heavenly planets, when you have good karma. As soon as the good karma runs out, down you come. You come back down again. It's just like, say you work very hard uh, here, up here in Denmark, and then uh, you have money for a vacation. So you take your savings and you go down, down to the Mediterranean or Canary Islands or some nice place. You stay there, you enjoy yourself. Your money's gone, back to Denmark. <laughs> back in the cold, dark winter, you know. So this is, this is karma's like that. So, it's, so as long as the subtle body is there, there's some kind of repeated birth and death in the material world. So, we have a, a spiritual personality. It's not that the soul uh, is not an individual, but what, what's our spiritual identity is now sort of not expressed. It's compact. And then when we release from the subtle body, uh, we discover who we are in relationship to Krishna and our eternal spiritual identity. That's what will happen. So devotional service dissolves the subtle body. Yeah. Yes. Uh, this is again uh, regarding subtle body. Uh, we have taken so many millions of lives before this life, mm -hmm. and subtle body is filled with all those memories. But we don't remember what happened in the earlier life. But there are a few exceptions where people they remember what happened. How does it happen? I don't know how it happens. There are very well documented cases of people who are able to remember their past lives. There was even a professor at the University of uh, Virginia with book titles like 12 Cases Suggestive of Reincarnation, where he actually took people, uh, children who spontaneously remembered a past life. Some people try to do this with hypnosis. But he's, you know, that's, 
We wanted to be really clean to find these children who actually remembered a past life and investigated their memories. He even has people who are born with a birthmark. Somebody has born when they have a big red splotch. This person remembered dying a violent death, goes back and finds the police photograph of that person with a bullet hole right here, you know? With, I mean, amazing stuff. <coughs> how it happens, I don't know. He doesn't know how it happens, but there are some people who remember. And th those are also documented in the Vedic literature that sometimes <coughs> people can remember their past lives. Uh, and to me, this is just an empirical fact uh, that, that this happens. Of course, most people don't know the difference between the subtle body and the self, the soul, because the, the consciousness, the, the ability to undergo experiences, that, that comes from the soul. So anywhere there's a living being, there's somebody go undergoing experiences. Uh, uh, people in the West t tends to think that, say, a dog is a kind of just a machine. But actually there's a soul there, same kind of soul that we are, but it's in a dog's body and undergoes dog experiences. It has the appropriate subtle body and the appropriate gross body that limit in a certain way. Uh, and uh, well, that's what they're undergoing. Huh? I guess it's time for a kirtan. Yeah. yeah? So we, we have to stop there. Thank you very much. Shri Prabhupada. His praise for Rinder Swarupki. No, I'm not my throat's too far down. Lucky I got through this glass. <laughs> so, hi, Krishna. Thank you to Rinsu Peru for lecturing today. Now we'll have uh, Kiesa and uh, 